In the first stages of World War II, at about 8.15 a.m. of August 6, 1945, an American Boeing B-25 Super Fortress bomber christened Enola Gay dropped the first atomic bomb in history over Hiroshima in Japan. The atomic blast generated an unimaginable ground heat of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit and a tremendous wind at the sonic speed of 2.7 miles per second. Everything within a 1.2 mile radius of the hypocenter was annihilated, instantly killing 140,000 people. Concrete buildings collapsed and broken glass flew as far as 9.9 .9 miles away. The atomic radiation generated by the bomb was so unbelievably strong that many of those outside of the range who were exposed to it lost all bodily functions. Their cells underwent apoptosis, a kind of cellular suicide, and died within days. Between the blast itself, the resulting fires throughout the city, and the irradiation burns, some estimate that around 200,000 citizens of Hiroshima lost their lives. Yet, in the midst of the burning bodies, charred skeleton, and structural damage just eight blocks from ground zero, exactly one kilometer away, a two-story Catholic presbytery miraculously remained intact. When an investigation was made, it was discovered that there survived a community of eight German Jesuit priests who were all found unscathered with only a few minor injuries. Among the survivors were Jesuit priests named Hugo Lazal, Hubert Schaefer, William Kleinsorg, Paul Ruge, and Hubert Sillink. Father Hubert Schaefer, who headed the community, was 30 years old when the atomic bomb exploded at Hiroshima and lived another 33 years in good health to tell the miracle. Well, priests witnessed and survived the Hiroshima blast. One of them, Father John Zymus, tells what he actually saw, an eyewitness account. I was in my room, which uh, faces the valley, and suddenly I saw a light, like magnesium light, flashlight, which uh, filled the whole valley, and looking out of my window to find out the reason for this peculiar phenomena, I saw nothing besides this light, and turning uh, uh, from the window to the door of my room, I heard a crash, it may, be, it may have been 10 seconds uh, after seeing the light, the flashlight. And immediately I was covered with splinters of the window frames and glass sticking uh, into the walls and actually my flesh itself. Uh, after a while we saw a procession of people coming from the outskirts of the city up the valley. Uh, many of them, most of them, were wounded, uh, especially the parts of the body which were not covered by uh, clothes, like hands, feet, uh, back. who lived uh, to this exper experience at the spot estimate the numbers of dead at least as 100,000. Uh, what is your opinion as to the story that the ruins of the city emit a deadly rain? Well, I think that it's just a rumor. Because I myself and uh, uh, others of us have worked in the city itself immediately after the explosion for several hours and we felt no ill effect at all. The same is said of the other seven priests of the community. Aside from some slight surface scratches, they all lived out their days in full health with no radiation sickness, no loss of hearing, or any other visible long-term defects or cancers from radiation. Father Schaefer was thoroughly examined and questioned by more than 200 scientists 
who were unable to explain how he and his companions had survived the atomic blast. He attributed the miracle of the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He declared, I was in the middle of the atomic explosion and I am still here alive and well. I was not struck down by its destruction. Furthermore, for several years, hundreds of experts and investigators continue to study and investigate the scientific reasons as to why the Presbytery House was not affected and when asked, Father Schaefer remarks each time, we believe that we survived because we were living the message of Fatima. We lived and prayed the rosary daily in that home. Unreinforced masonry or brick walls representative of commercial constructions are destroyed at 3 PSI, which will also cause car damage and burnt windows. At 10 PSI, a human will experience severe lung and heart damage, bursted eardrums, and at 20 PSI, your limbs can be blown away. Your head will be blown off by 40 PSI, and no residential or unreinforced commercial construction would be left standing. At 80 PSI, even reinforced concrete is heavily damaged and no human would be alive because your skull would be crushed. All cotton cloth would be on fire at 350 degrees Fahrenheit and your lungs would be inoperative with a minute's breathing air even for a few seconds at these temperatures. The expected outcome described by this expert in fact perfectly describes that what occurred in the area immediately surrounding the Jesuit rectory. One of the survivors, Paul Rue, said years later in his recollections of the event that after the nuclear bat blast occurred, he opened his eyes and found himself laying on the ground. He looked around and there was nothing in any direction. The railroad station and buildings in all directions were leveled to the ground. The only physical harm to himself was that he could feel a few pieces of glass in the back of his neck. As far as he could tell, there was nothing else physically wrong. There are no physical laws to explain why the Jesuits were untouched in the Hiroshima air blast. All who were at this range from the epicenter should have received enough radiation to be dead within at most a matter of minutes if nothing else happened to them. There is no known way to design a uranium of 235 atomic bomb which could leave such a large discrete area intact while destroying everything around it immediately outside the fireball. From a scientific point of view, what happened to those Jesuits at Hiroshima still defies all human logic from the laws of physics as understood today or at any time in the future. It must be concluded that some other external force was present whose power and or capability to transform energy 
and matter is beyond current comprehension. We knew the world would not be the same. Two people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. Father Schaefer, one of the eight Jesuit priests who survived the atomic blast of Hiroshima, attributed the miracle of the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He declared, I was in the middle of the atomic explosion, and I am still here alive and well. I was not struck down by its destruction. Furthermore, for several years, hundreds of experts and investigators continue to study and investigate the scientific reasons as to why the Presbytery House was not affected. And when asked, Father Schaefer remarks each time, we believe we survived the atomic blast because we lived the message of Fatima. We lived and prayed the rosary daily in that home. But what is the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima? In the autumn of 1917, as the brutality and savagery of the First World War overwhelmed Europe, Pope Benedict XV made repeated pleas for peace, and finally, in May 1917, made a direct appeal to the Blessed Mother to intercede for peace in the world. Just over a week later, Our Lady began to appear at Fatima, Portugal, to three shepherd children, Lucia de Santos, age 10, and her cousins, Francisco and Jacinta Marto, age 9 and 7. Fatima is a small village about 70 miles north of Lisbon. The Fatima apparition actually began in the spring of 1916, when the Angel of Peace appeared to the children three times to prepare them for their meeting with the Queen of Heaven. As they were looking after their sheep one day in the spring, dazzling, beautiful young man, seemingly made of light, appeared and told them, Do not be afraid. I am the angel of peace. He invited to pray with him the pardon prayer and said the hearts of Jesus and Mary were attentive to their prayers. The angel appeared to the children again in the summer. He encouraged them to pray and make sacrifices as a way of drawing down peace on their country. He also revealed that he was the guardian angel of Portugal. The angel came a third time in the autumn. He appeared before them holding a chalice in his hands. A host was suspended above it, from which drops of blood were falling into the chalice. The angel left the chalice suspended in the air and prostrated himself before it in prayer. He taught them a prayer of Eucharistic reparation. He then gave the host to Lucia and the chalice to Francisco and Jacinta, saying, Take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by ungrateful men. Make reparations for their crimes. Console your God. The angel fell prostrate to the ground and repeated the prayer three times and disappeared. The children remained in prayer for a long time. On the 13th of May, 1917, the three children took their flocks out to pasture in the small area known as the Cove of Peace. They suddenly saw a bright flash of light, following quickly by another flash in a clear blue sky. They looked up in the sky, in Lucia's words, 
a lady clothed in white, brighter than the sun, radiating light more clear and intense than a crystal cup filled with sparkling water lit by burning sunlight. The lady smiled and said, Do not be afraid. I will not harm you. I come from heaven. She asked them to come to the cove at the same hour on the 13th day for six months. Then she said, Are you willing to offer yourselves to God and bear all suffering he wills to send you as an act of reparation for the conversion of sinners? Lucia, speaking for all three, said, Yes. The lady replied, Then you are going to have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort. Lucia recounted that at that same moment, she opened her hands and streamed an immense light that penetrated their souls. They fell to the ground, repeating a prayer that was communicated to them interiorly. O most holy Trinity, I adore thee. My God, my God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. The lady then said, Say the rosary every day to bring peace to the world and the end of the war. She then began to rise above towards the east until she disappeared. As word about the apparition spread, the attitude of the local townspeople ranged from skepticism to utter contempt, and the children thereby suffered many insults. They would have much to suffer, just as the lady had told them. June 13, 1917 about 50 people turned up at the cove at noon on June 13th. The children saw a flash of light followed immediately by the apparition of Mary as she spoke to Lucia. I want you to come on the 13th of next month to pray the rosary every day and to learn to read. Later, I will tell you what I want. She told them that Francisco and Jacinta would go to heaven soon but Lucia would remain on earth a while longer to help spread devotion to her immaculate heart through the world. As Jesus desires, Lucia was sad at this and asked, Am I to stay here alone? Mary replied, No, my daughter. Are you suffering a great deal? Don't lose heart. I will never forsake you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. She then opened her hands in radiant, immense light. In her right hand, she held her heart encircled with thorns. Lucia said they understood it to be the immaculate heart in need of reparation. July 13, 1917 on July 13, the three children assembled at the cove and again saw Our Lady over the oak tree. Mary told them again to come each month and said, Continue to pray the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary in order to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war because only she can help you. She promised in October she would tell them who she was and perform a miracle for all to see and believe. Then continued, sacrifice yourself for sinners and say many times, especially when you make some sacrifice, O oh Jesus, it is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners and reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The first and second part of the secret, a vision of hell and prophecies. As she spoke these words, Mary opened her hands and rays of light from them seemed to penetrate the earth, revealing to the children a terrifying vision of hell full of demons, lost souls, amid indescribable horrors. The visions of hell was the first of the three-part secret of Fatima. The children looked up to the sad face of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who spoke to them kindly, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, 
a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes. By means of war, famine, and persecution of the church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecution of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. The third part of the secret, an angel with a flaming sword. The third part, as written down by Sister Lucia, on January 3rd, 1944, I write in obedience to you, my God, who command me to do so through His Excellency, the Bishop of Lyra, and through your most holy mother and mine, after the two part which I have already explained at the left of Our Lady and the little above, he saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hands, flashing it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance, penance, penance. And we saw in an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishop, priest, men and women, religious going up to a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross, a rough hewn trunks as of cork trees with bark before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting steps. Afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain on his knees and on the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And at the same way, there died one after another, the other bishop, priest, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions, Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal asperium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. Our Lady told Lucia not to tell anyone about the secret at this time, apart from Francisco. Before the apparition ended, she gave these final words. When you pray the rosary, say after each mystery, O oh my Jesus, forgive us, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those who are most in need. August 1917 As August 13th approached, the story of the apparition had reached the anti-religious secular press. And while this ensured that the whole country knew about Fatima, it also meant that many biases and negative reports were circulating. The children were kidnapped on the morning of the 13th by the local mayor. They were interrogated about the secret and were told to say the apparitions were a lie. Despite his threats of death, they refused to comply or divulge the secret, saying they would rather die than tell a lie. He finally released them on August 15th. Late in the afternoon of August 19th, the Virgin appeared to the children in a place near Fatima. She told them to continue to say the rosary every day, and again promised a miracle in October, stating the miracle would have been greater if they had not been kidnapped. Looking very sad, she said, Pray. 
pray very much and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell because there are none to sacrifice themselves and pray for them. With that, she rose into the air and moved towards the east before disappearing. By now, the children had thoroughly absorbed Mary's plea for prayer and penance and did everything they could to answer it. They prayed for hours while lying prostrate on the ground and went long days without drinking water in the heat of summer. They gave their lunches to poor children as sacrifice for sinners. They even knotted some pieces of old rope around their waist as a form of mortification. September 13, 1917 On September 13, very large crowds began to converge in Fatima from all directions. Around noon, the children arrived. After the customary flash of light, they saw Mary on the oak tree. She spoke to Lucia, Continue to pray the rosary in order to obtain the end of the war. In October, Our Lord will come, as well as Our Lady of Sorrows and Our Lady of Mount Carmel. St. Joseph will appear with the child Jesus to bless the world. God is pleased with your sacrifice. October 13, 1917, The Miracle of the Sun The prediction of the public miracle caused intense speculation throughout Portugal, and the reporter Alvin de la Mita published a satirical article in the anti-religious newspaper O Seculo. People from other parts of the country descended by the tens of thousands despite the terrible storm that lashed the mountains country around Fatima on the eve of October 13th. Many pilgrims walked barefoot, reciting the rosary as went into the area around the cove. By mid-morning, heavy rains began to fall and the mud was ankle-deep. The children reached the oak tree around noon and then saw the flash of light as Mary appeared before them. Lucia asked what she wanted. I want to tell you that a chapel is to be built here in my honor. I am the lady of the rosary. Continue always to pray the rosary every day. The war is going to end, and the soldiers will soon return to their homes. Lucia made some requests for cures, conversions, and other things. Many responded, some yes, but not others. They must amend their lives and ask forgiveness for their sins. Our Lady grew very sad and said, Do not offend the Lord our God any more, because he is already so much offended. Then, opening her hands, she made them reflect on the sun, and as she ascended, the reflection of her own light continued to be projected on the sun itself. After she disappeared, as the people witnessed the predicted miracle, the children saw the vision foretold during the September apparition. The Promised Miracle The Miracle of the Sun October 13, 1917 has come to be known as the day the sun danced. The headlines on the article by Almeida in O Seculo. During the solar phenomenon, the sun whirled and zigzagged, casting colors about the crowd as it began to descend towards the earth. The 70,000 people assembled cried in terror, thinking it was the end of the world. After about 10 minutes, the sun returned to the sky. Then how they win began to blow despite the leaves on the trees remaining still. The rain-soaked people were suddenly dry and their clothes clean, and the ground was completely dry. Many physical cures of the blind and the lame were reported. The countless unreserved public confessions of sins and commitments to conversion of life attest to the authenticity of what they saw. The miracle is reported to have been seen from as far as 15 to 25 miles away thus ruling out the possibility of any type of collective hallucination or mass hypnosis. No such phenomenon of the sun was reported anywhere in the world, and scientists were unable to explain it. Doubters and skeptics had become believers. Even the on-site reporter's Alameda stood by his story later on it in spite of harsh criticisms. When we, when we get on the cover, I see the soldiers try to stop us uh, to get on, uh, down in the cover. Everything was wet, it was a good three, three inches of water, 
and marred everything in the ground. I was, uh, I say, between 7,500 feet from the, from the hill and from the tree. And the sun started breaking, and then the sun started rolling, uh, like dancing from one place to another place. And then we see the sun come towards the, where the shield and where the tree. And we see the sun come right into the tree. And the sun, about a minute or so, and the sun started rolling back again the way he came in. My God, my God. Everybody started howling, crying. Some started to confess himself. Even my mother grabbed myself when he, he squeezed me to her and he started crying at the end of the world. The wind started to blow pretty hard, real hard. But the ground was dry just like about this morning. And then our clothes, we no feel at all, the clothes dry. Clothes and we dry. look at we was clean, just clean the clothes come from the laundry. I can get an eye on my mind, that was a miracle, a real miracle. Friends, the subject of this telecast is a movie and an historical event. The movie was produced by Warner Brothers, Our Lady of Fatima. We asked Mr. Jack Warner if he would permit us to show a section of that classic film on this particular show. And the graciousness and the immediacy and the spontaneity of his ascent has made us indeed his debtor. The historical event is that upon which this particular film was based. And it is of the historical event, first of all, that we would speak before we show you the movie. The event itself might be called almost the birthday of the modern world. Because it was on that day that the forces of good and evil seem to reach their peak. Our modern world, with its great crises, began on the date of October 13th, 1917. We will take you quickly to three cities and show you what happened on that day, first in Moscow, secondly in Rome, and third in a little village in Portugal called Fatima. October 13th, 1917, Moscow. Maria Alexandrovich, a young Russian noble lady, was teaching religion to a group of 200 children in the Church of the Iberian Virgin. And suddenly there was a distraction. Horsemen entered the front door, down the middle aisle, both of the communion rail, destroyed the icons, the statuary, the altar, and then attacked the children, killing many of them. Maria Alexandrovich ran out of the church screaming. She knew that there was an imminent revolution by the communists, and she went to Lenin, whom she knew, and she said, a most terrible thing has happened. I was teaching catechism to my children. Horsemen came in charge them and kill some of them. Lenin said, I know it. I sent them. It was one of the events that heralded at the beginning of the terrible communist revolution that has since harassed the world. Rome. October 13th, 1917, the same hour, midday. Church bells are ringing all through the city. It was a joyful event. A bishop was being consecrated. His 
name, Vinio Pacelli. A man who then was not very well known, but who one day would come face to face with this great revolutionary force and would become the greatest spiritual force in the world against it. After his consecration on that 13th day of October 1917, he went to Munich. At that particular time, the communists were very strong. They were under the leadership in Munich of Karl Liebknecht, and then one of those curious women that communism spawned. Rosa Luxemburg, and an order went out to kill 325 so-called enemies. And one of them was this same Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli. The commander of the Southern Communist Army, whose name was Eiler, Brother Seiler, and his aide-de-camp, Rongratz, brought in some soldiers with hand grenades. Seiler himself was armed. They got into the house by a kind of a ruse, and they hid behind a curtain, waiting for the footfall of this man of whom we're speaking. And as he walked down the corridor, Seiler was hiding behind a curtain. And he threw out his gun to shoot him. And the gun struck the pectoral cross on his breast, fell to the floor. Archbishop Pacelli reached over and picked it up, handed it back to Siler, said, here is your gun. Kill him if you wish. I am only interested in the souls of my people. Siler and Ron Grants went back and they were unable to explain why they did not get their man. They could not explain why they were haunted by that lean figure. There was only one thing they did know, and that was that from that time on, that man would be afraid of absolutely nothing in all the world. And that man became Pius XII. And that pectoral cross that he was wearing that night, I am wearing now. Pius XII, he gave it to his esteemed friend, his eminence Cardinal Spellman, who this evening kindly gave it to me when I told him I wished to speak of this incident. October 13th, 1917, there's a little village in Fatima where three little children, Maria, Asinta, and Francis, were gathered expecting a revelation. They had said that Mary, the mother of God, had appeared to them. It was not surprising, of course, if she had. It might very well have been. The Lord came through her. Through her, he worked his first miracle. And then from the cross, he commended us all to her with his kind words. Behold thy mother. The children said that the lady had appeared to her before. Appeared to them before on the 13th of April, and May, and June, and July, 19th of August, and the 13th of September. And in the course of the revelation, something very interesting was said, which goes to show there's something more important in this world than politics. It was said by the lady that this world war will end in a little over another year. Now remember the date, October 13th, 1917. We went to war that year on Good Friday, our country. The war did end in a little over another year on the 11th of November, 1918. And then the lady told the children to tell the world that there would come a great era of peace to the world if 
the world would only return to God. And Russia would be converted. But, he said, if the world does not return to God, at the close of the next pontificate, that is to say in the year 1936, there will be the beginnings of a second world war in Spain. So evidently heaven regarded that civil war as the beginning of World War II. And then she said, but to prevent it, I ask that men do penance and prayer and return again to God. If they do not do penance, there will come World War II, which will be more terrible than World War I. Nations will be destroyed, cities blotted out, the good will suffer persecution, Russia will spread its errors and persecution throughout the world, and the Holy Father himself will suffer much. And then she gave a word of hope, but in the end, God will triumph. The Second World War need not have come. It was unnecessary. Wars are not just made by politics. Wars are crises and judgments that come upon us because of the way we live. But there had to be some sign that this revelation was true. And 70,000 people gathered at Fatima this particular day with the children. Now what is interesting is that most of them were unbelievers. Portugal in those days was anarchistic, communistic, atheistic, anti-clerical. They came out of curiosity. Some of them doubted, most of them doubted that anything would happen, but the children said that the lady told them that there would be a great miracle, which would be a proof that she had actually appeared. And the proof was what was called the miracle of the sun. The sun, according to the testimony of these 70,000 people, and also according to the testimony of the atheistic anarchistic newspapers, which I read and which indeed were very interesting, because they said this actually happened, but we hope that nobody will interpret it in a divine way. And the sun seemed almost to detach itself. And to become like a great silver ball. And then shooting out sparks in all directions. It almost precipitated itself, or so it seemed. Precipitated itself upon the people. And they shouted to God for prayer. Prayer and supplication, and in sorrow and in contrition. Miracles took place in the sights of them all. No, it rained all the time. When this phenomenon had taken place three times, everyone found that their clothes were dry. From that time on, Fatima became kind of a gathering place of all of the people of the world who believed that peace was made somewhere else than at the tables of politicians. Namely, peace was made by prayer and reparation and expiation, sacrifice. On October 13th, 1951, I was at Fatima There were one million people. They gathered the night before, and all night long it rained. One of those cold rains on those, one of these Portuguese mountaintops. But they stood and they knelt and they prayed for the peace of the world. I stayed with them till three o'clock, and I was one of the few that had a cot. 
And I went in and laid down. I was tired. But you could not sleep. The luxury of a cot. And here are a million people, most of whom are walked 50, 75, and 100 miles over during several days. In order to do penance. So the only thing to do was to get out of bed and pray with them through the night. And then the next morning, pray for the peace of the world. And when Warner Brothers did this particular film, they left the realm of imagination and technique. And they went to Fatima that particular night and the close of the particular film, which you are about to witness, shows the crowd. That particular night that I was there, now the film. As I stood there on that altar, overlooking that great crowd of one million people, all of them waving the white handkerchiefs as white flags of purity, in tribute to peace and to the Lady of Peace. My mind left that white square and went to the red square of Moscow, where there were red flags tied red in the blood of the victims. Somehow I felt that on this day there was the great crisis between the white square of Fatima and the red square of Moscow. Somehow or other one felt certain and secure about peace. If we could just magnify this crowd and these petitions and this spirit throughout the world. And in my imagination, I could see a great change coming over the hammer and the sickle. I could see that hammer that had beaten down so many homes and profaned so many sanctuaries. I could see it being held aloft by millions of men and looking now like a cross. And that sickle, which the communists use to cut human life like unripe wheat. I now saw its changing its figure and its symbolism and becoming, as the book of the apocalypse said, the moon under the lady's feet. This is the way to peace. World War II need not have happened if men had returned to God. World War III need not happen. And it will not happen if we as a nation return again to God. If there is a Cold War here and a Cold War anywhere else, it is because our hearts and our souls are not on flame with love of God.